So um, small group, this is based on, you know, a full time 15 to 20 minute schedule. Um, so I'll explain sort of how that rotation is written in the, in the teacher's manual. Um, obviously, with part time schedules, you'll have to make adjustments to that. So the guiding principles are that small groups provide children with hands-on targeted learning opportunities that are grounded in core concepts and a lot of the times related to the read-alouds that we're doing. Key vocabulary and references to the text are used throughout and the expectation is that each child in the classroom participate in literacy and small group and math small group activities throughout the week. And here's a picture of some kiddos working on Maps. Some color and counting activities, um, some nature activities going on here, stories, and um, letters. So in the curriculum, you'll see that small groups are based on three groups on a three-day rotation. This can be a little bit confusing. That's why I've created this graph here to show you how it works. I don't know why that's off the page, but groups are a combination, as I said, of math and literacy, as well as some other foundational skills that are constructed of varying teacher engagement. So some groups are high support group where a teacher will want to be um, really sitting and facilitating mostly. Lower support groups are more monitored by an adult, so maybe your ed tech is in that, in that group in supporting those learners or just there to, to supervise. And then there's usually one or two independent groups. Um, if, if you have a large group or you need to make groups smaller, maybe four groups is what you want to aim for, especially this year. And then um, teachers that are working either in a high support or low support group will sort of monitor what's happening in the independent group. So if these are your groups here, if you have just for the sake of color names, red, blue, and a yellow group. On day one, red group is doing a letter match, blue group is doing color sorting, and yellow is doing book browsing. That would be probably your independent group. Your higher support might be the letter match at the beginning of the year. In color sorting, they might be more comfortable with that would be a low support activity. The next day, groups are still the same three colors, and then you just move the activity so that, um, let's see, so that now red is in the independent group. And then again on day three, you move it one more time. If you have three groups, if you have four groups, maybe you need a four day rotation. The way that the curriculum is written is on these three days. And then after the three days take place, every group has done each activity. So then the next day, there'll be a new set of small groups, a new set of activities. It's a lot. <laughs> so it's up to you if you want your groups to be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Um, you want to make necessary or immediate changes to your small groups. Um, let's see, your composition should be flexible and intentionally planned based on your observations and assessments for other data in the classroom. Um, I usually reevaluate my groups after each unit if there aren't any immediate changes that need to be made. That's it. <laughs> So Melissa's asking if I introduce small groups and I do at the beginning of um, so if we're getting a new set of three small groups I will introduce each small group just like you would do at intro to centers I have the materials I'm modeling how we'll be using the materials, and then I separate them, separate them into their small groups. The next day, day two, where their groups are changing, I will just sort of do a quick recap um, and just say, so today the yellow group is matching letters, and so forth. 
can go through each one without as lengthy of an explanation before day one. You want to? <laughs> okay. So, in the beginning of the year, all of the independent groups, they're not really an independent group because you're still going to have to teach them the protocols and your expectations. So, even if it's something as simple as book browsing, you can take that time at the beginning of the year, those first two or three weeks, and teach them how to sit down independently without an adult there and teach them how they're supposed to be sitting there looking at the book, how they're supposed to treat the book. Introducing it as a center mm -hmm. so that they're they're getting used to that um, routine and expectation before the independent small group began. So it's important really to take those first few weeks and work on independent groups, even if it's if they're using Play-Doh um, and like the letter mat or eating. Mm -hmm. um, so in your first two weeks, you are following the kind of an abbreviated version of your schedule. So maybe during small group time, the small group activities are Play-Doh and meeting and those independent activities. I, I, I love her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's one idea. Yeah. Um, and also, if you find that your kiddos are really loving a small group activity, and every group has had a chance to do that activity within the three days, you can tell that their interest is super high, incorporate that activity then into center time. So um, maybe they're not so interested in the animal puzzles, but they still really want to play letter matching games. Then put that letter matching game on as a tabletop activity during center. So these small group activities can also be put into center activity. Um, can you switch the groups every week or do you recommend only switching the groups after each unit? Um, you can switch the groups every week if they're, you know, if you find that you want to. Um, I don't, yeah, it's not working. I have before that I had a student who their big skill level had really changed unexpectedly for me anyway. And so I have moved kids even during, um, like in the middle of yeah. a unit, but I'll wait until like that week of small groups is done and then I'll switch the groups around. I try not to switch it around too much, but yeah. there are definitely times when either there are just two personalities that aren't working together and you really think that they should probably be in different groups. Or like I said, if, if you're grouping them by skill level and somebody is in a different group, yeah, I think that keeping them together at least for a little while, if you don't have any need to make a, an immediate change, allows them to sort of build relationships with that group in a smaller setting. Um, but it's up to you, really. One part that was confusing for me with small groups, and it took me a bit to like get used to, was that a new rotation of small groups doesn't always necessarily start on Monday. It doesn't always necessarily go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we have other things Thursday, Friday. We start a new rotation Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because we know that the school schedule doesn't go like that, especially next year. It's probably not going to go like that, but there's always a Monday off or a snow day thrown in there or whatever. It's a three-day rotation. If your new rotation starts on Tuesday, then it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Or if you've got a special event on Thursday and you're not doing small groups, then it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. It's just whatever the next three available days are. And then you can start a new one Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, start a new one Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Monday. You know, so it just keeps rotating regardless of what yeah, special so, day of the week it is. Yeah. So don't attach day one to necessarily Monday. Right. It's just focus on how many groups you have and making sure that each of the groups engages in each of the small groups before introducing the Yes. I have a question. What, um, what time of day do you normally find the best small group? So it's I a specific special like, time to really yeah. What time, time of day is yeah. best for small groups? Um, I have, I do my small group in between 
my rest time and my special in the afternoon. So mine falls after lunch time. Yeah, that's that's just where it works best in my schedule. Question, Christine. <laughs> Any other questions? Just my advice with scheduling would be that design it around what is best for the learner, and then push your administrator to work in the other pieces to meet the needs of the Yes. So. It was suggested to design <laughs> your small groups, your schedule based on the needs of your learners, and then worry about those excess activities by talking to your admin about them. And we had that experience with our administrator who wanted to possibly move specials in the morning, but then understood that centers. Yeah, our centers are such a big piece of time in the morning, morning that we wouldn't want to interrupt that time by putting our specials. But we'll talk more and give more opportunities to talk about scheduling and um, show you some sample schedules that we use in our classroom um, so you have a better feel for that. So I have a question. Is it a high support group or is it a high support activity? So that you're moving with the activity or are you staying with that group no matter what the activity is? So this is a scary question. <laughs> That's what you yeah. Um, so the way that the curriculum is written, it is a high support activity. So the usually the acre, the head teacher in the classroom would stay with that activity while the groups filter. So what I do in my class is I stay with the high support activity, and then um, my ed tech is with the group that's kind of like medium support, but she's kind of going back and forth between her group and then the independent group, just checking and make sure they're okay. Or if maybe they're getting a little too loud, she'll go and check in with them. Um, and then yeah. rotate. So placement-wise, I usually typically keep my independent group near my lower medium support group where my ed tech is, so that she can visually see everything that's going on between the two groups. So even if they're independent and not just setting them away to work while they are still being monitored. I have a question. No. Not from the chat room, but from myself. Could you address the um, one or two children who, like, they enjoy book browsing and they refuse to go with their group or they wander, that sort of thing, when you're at a high support group or how to kind of get them redirected? Do you have that? <laughs> how that happens? So she was asking so. about um, maybe students that, that are hesitant to go with their group to try the new activity. Um, for me, I just try to make each group fair as interesting as I can when I'm introducing it um, and just trying to get them to try something new, maybe offering them to sit with the ed tech or sit with myself and just sort of see and, and observe before they engage if they're not sure about engaging. Um, sometimes if book browsing is just not working as an independent group, doing something that's more hands-on, like beading or Play-Doh as a different option um, so that they're more engaged. In my experience, though, I really haven't had that yeah. happen. The kids look forward to small groups. They love it. They love being in a small group and having more um, kind of one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher. It's something they really look forward to and they get excited about. So it hasn't really been an issue. But like Jesse was saying, if there is a small group that's planned in the schedule and you've tried it and it's just not working for your kids, don't have to stick with that. You can choose a different independent group that you know is going to work for your kids and they're going to benefit from that. Yeah, especially if you can throw in any sensory or fine motor that, that they'll really enjoy. Anybody else? All set? All right. which we'll look at um, today a little later just to help you navigate what that looks like. 
there is a time in your schedule for a large group. And a couple of times a week, that's going to be, let's find out about it. So um, it's usually pretty short. It lasts about 10 minutes, if that. I do my, my children have special in the afternoon and there's a transition and we do let's find out about it before getting ready for the end of our day. Um, it is a whole group meeting and it's an opportunity to provide them with additional information about the things you've already introduced through Read Aloud and your center work. Um, and really I think the easiest way to find out more about this is to really go through what you're learning in each of the units. So you get an idea to see really how much the children are going to be exposed to as you do let's find out about it. So in unit one, you are learning about caring for babies. All of the let's find out about it lessons refer back to or tie into a read aloud or more than one read aloud. And so you're caring for babies and you'll show them images of families burping their baby, um, cuddling their baby, feeding their baby, changing their baby's diaper. You might have some of those materials available to show them. And then you can add those materials to your dramatization center so that the children can use those with the baby dolls. Um, this is the time where I usually have my family send in family photos or baby photos of their children. Um, you'll talk about baby furniture, and then you're getting into vocabulary from Peter's chair. You're talking about cradles, um, high chairs. That's when I add those stuff into my dramatization center. Um, you do hardware store, which ties back to Peter's chair. If appropriate, you can add tools to the manipulative center or some sort of uh, toy that kind of replicates that. You talk about pets. I like to... Uh, Probably can't do this this year, but usually then add some stuffed animal pets to the dramatization center um, and have families send in photos. We make graphs with those photos. Uh, you're talking about fasteners with them from corduroy and his buttons. And um, there's a book to read about fasteners. I don't remember what it's called. Um, you can add fasteners to manipulatives. I know Sarah has done fasteners with her children. Um, buttoning and zipping and Velcro. Uh, sometimes a Bombaloo is a read aloud where a child gets angry and she becomes Bombaloo. And we talk a lot about masks. And so um, we will be making masks in the art center. So you're kind of extending and introducing that concept. We talk about signs. And after this one, families always send an email we were driving in the car. They were reading the signs as we were passing. Um, musical instruments, which uh, refers back to Hello Goodbye Window. You're listening to music by Tito Puente. You're reading a book called Charlie Parker Play Bebop. And during centers, I would randomly show Charlie Parker Play and Isabel. Jesse's daughter would go Bebop from wherever she was in centers. We love music. Um, and then I also go into our music room and bring percussion into this Let's Find Out About It and just let them explore that and play with that and go sing songs with that. So it's more than just showing pictures or reading a new book, like finding other ways to bring that into a real life experience for them. Um, and then the other one is how people get around. You're reading a book called On the Go. You're talking about Peter's chair. He gets around by walking. Um, on his feet, how do you get around, or how do you get to school, and tying in some of those transportation social studies concepts. So, any questions about Unit 1? Let's find out about it. Um, so, here is what the lesson plan looks like for Let's Find Out About It. You'll have, you know, at the top, Let's Find Out About It. You have the standards that you're meeting. So, if you are doing an observation with your administrator and you're going to have them come in and observe any of the lesson plans in the units and you want to write down what standards they're meeting, they're all there at the right hand corner. Here are the materials that you need for caring for babies. You need the book Cry Baby because that's the book it refers back to. Uh, rattles, blankets, baby toys, 
uh, baby items like spoons or little Legos that babies might play with, um, and images of caring for babies, which can be found in the resources on the website that we'll show you. So all of the resources have been created for everything in the curriculum. Um, and then here's your script. So, you know, and my baby, baby's family took care of her. And you can show the illustrations of baby being taken care of. And here are some images of other families taking care of their babies. What do you notice? And they know that word because we use it a lot in thinking and feedback. And they'll respond. And you're using words like soothing, uncomfortable. If the baby's uncomfortable, how can we help them? Um, here are some things that you might use to soothe your baby in demonstrating that. Um, why is this, whatever it is, safer for the baby? It's smaller or it's bigger so they won't choke on it. And then at the bottom of most of the lessons for Let's Find Out About It, you'll find what to do with it next. Um, so add materials to dramatization, ask families to send in photos, use the photos in writing and drawing to write family stories, um, and so different ideas. So here are the things. Oh, sorry. Before you go on, sorry. That's okay. Um, so the question from the chat room is: Do you incorporate other books, or is it strictly the recommended text? Because she has such a huge library or collection of titles that she really hates to give up. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. When we did the pilot, we did not do anything except the curriculum to fidelity. Um, because we as a district really wanted to know, does this work? And the state of Maine really wanted to know, what do we need to change? And, um, but yes, now we do. There's that first couple weeks of school where you can share your favorite books that you share with them. Um, the units are five weeks. And in that fifth week, there's time to share um, other activities and favorite books with them. And I would just say throughout the day, especially in the winter, when you're not getting outside as much, because, you know, I don't know, at our school, we're limited by temperatures and asked to stay inside, and that's when I'm bringing out my books. And if you have books, you can go way back to the evening. So if you have books about family and friends and family and friends, you can fill your library. Yeah. Can you repeat that? I sure can. So Jesse said, um, if you have books that relate to something that you are learning or talking about in the units, then you can definitely fill your library with those books or share those books with your children. You know, you're reading Charlie Parker played Bebop. Maybe you have another, you know, rhythmic music book that you can share with them. There's plenty of time, I think, in the schedule to do that. Um, so in unit two, we are reading Little Red Hen Makes a Pizza, um, talking a lot about cooking pans and utensils, adding that to the kitchen area. Um, you talk about how food goes from farm to table. And the resource, I believe, shows photographs. Last year, I set up in the block center a farm on one end and the road and brought in trucks and showed them visually how it would go from farm to table. You could probably find a video, a kid-friendly video about that. Um, beautiful stuff, which is recycled small materials. You can send a letter out to your families asking for donations. If you do that, prepare for donations, because I think we could never find enough space to tuck it all that came in. Um, grocery store jobs. So your dramatization center will become a grocery store. And in Let's Find Out About It, you'll learn about the different jobs that people do in the grocery store. And then I add those as name card necklaces to the grocery store center. Um, road builders. So this is the friendship unit and you're talking about cooperation and working together. And you're reading a book called Road Builders and you're talking about how they work together to build the road. Let's see. Markets around the world. We like to compare the markets with local stores and what, you know, the, what we're looking at on the resource and the photographs, how does that compare to when you go shopping with mom at Hannaford? Um, you could invite farmers in to visit. I haven't done that yet, but I'm certainly, we're surrounded by farmers out there in West 
feel um, so you could put that out to your families would anybody like to come in and visit and talk about that i was going to say if you're allowed to which probably not this year but they could do a video or do it through zoom or there's so many different ways to share um, advertisement signs, which refers back to Litter Red Hen makes a pizza because she goes to the store to buy all the ingredients that she needs and Matthew and Tilly. Um, and you can add those size, signs to dramatization and to your writing centers. And my kids always spend the next couple weeks making signs to hang up in the grocery store. Um, lovies. So they can share photos for their actual lovies. Uh, barber shop. So now your dramatization center is going to become a barber shop. We're inspired by Dandelion. He goes to get his hair cut before a party. Uh, this is one of my kids' favorite centers. So it's a tip. So we use Play Doh scissors. So if you don't have that in your classroom, get some because it won't actually cut their hair. And we talk about that. We don't use real scissors because we're not really hairstylists. Um, but we're going to pretend. And we have, you know, a chair and one child tips their head back with the apron on and they're washing their hair in the sink and then they're cutting it and they stay there the whole time. We love it. I get my hair done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it looks so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then celebrations and talking about writing invitations to celebration, having a celebration, your dress up area becomes a, like a party center. Um, celebration area. Uh, let's see. So, aside from the cute kid, I chose this because it shows one of the signs that they made. It says apples, and they're ten dollars. So those are some expensive apples. Um, question from the chat room. Sure. Um, um, do you guys have you found the best place to get the books for the curriculum, or do you just order online, or is there a certain place where it's so the question is, where have we gotten the books for the curriculum? And Nicole, maybe you can answer that better than I would. Yeah, I mean, we purposely assured that all of the books that are required for read alouds or let's find out about it um, lessons were currently published. So they weren't out of, because that was some of the issues with the OWL curriculum. Some of the books were no longer being published, so they were impossible to find or incredibly expensive. So all of the books should be currently published so you, anywhere, truly, like Amazon, Barnes and any bookstore. Um, like I said, libraries, if you're um, wanting to have an extra copy, but you don't need to have one for, for always, and you could always borrow one for your library. Um, but anywhere you can find them. We don't, I want to say that we bought them typically either straight from the publisher. Um, some of them are even like scholastic books. Some of them are just good old fashioned, well-known books that we love. Yeah. Barnes yeah, Barnes and Noble and Barnes Amazon. She said. So our district has ordered all of our books through Barnes and Noble. Yeah, and I know Barnes and Noble has, or often, is it always a teacher discount, or is it just periodically? What we found was that they could give us a better deal yeah. on Amazon, and Amazon is complicated for business departments yes. because they have all that outsourcing. Barnes and Noble, you're getting one. They stand by the order. So Barnes and Noble has typically given our district a better deal because they're able to work right within that the framework that we work. And we just ordered all of our books through Amazon. Yeah, and yeah, and another so yeah, district mentioned Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. 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 Yes. So one participant here books. mentioned that when they ordered their books, they ordered uh, like paperback or hardcover, but also board books for those children who need access to kind of that type of reading material, which mm -hmm. might be a good idea for this year because I think they'll be easier to wipe down. I can talk to you about laminated books when we talk about the outdoor side. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You can talk to us about a lot of things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah. Good. Okay. That's good. And again, you want at least two copies of the core text so that you have a teacher copy and a child copy. Um, sometimes, I think I have three of some of them, and I tuck that third one away because I don't want anyone touching it until I really need it. <laughs> um, so unit three, you're looking at, so it's wind and water. 
So in Let's Find Out About It, you're looking at what air moves. And you saw a photo of them yesterday blowing through the straws. It uh, really depends on where we're at during Unit 3, which for me happens around December or January. Um, by then, maybe we can do that. I doubt it. So instead, I'll bring in hair dryers. And maybe we're exploring what air moves using the hair dryer. Um, there's different ways. Don't be bound by the idea that you have to do it a certain way. I think there's ways to get around it and still explore these concepts. Yes. So I have a question. For let's find out about it. Are you discussing like, the process and having a video or pictures and discussing what we're going to do, but not actually do that activity yet? Because you only have about 10 minutes. Is that what you're saying? Or do you do so the question way? is, um, during Let's Find Out About It, do I go through the process and introduce it without actually doing the activity? And it really depends on the topic. So for this one, I would introduce the scientific process of, you know, here are these couple of items. Uh, where Do you think that the air will move these items? And we kind of generally predict as a group. And then I would go through using the hair dryer to move the item and we observe it, and how should we record our results? And they know that language by then, and so they're saying we can draw it, we can write it down, we should make a graph, and then we do that. And yeah, that will only take 10 or 15 minutes to do that. I just kind of downsize it. I'm just gonna add to that. Okay. So the let's find out about it activities are really your concept developing moments of the of the curriculum. So it's not necessarily happening every single day, but where it is a whole group activity, we know children are, can only sustain their focus for so long in whole group. So in units one, unit two, the activities might be a little quicker, um, the concepts not so in depth, but getting there. But the other really important part of this, the whole curriculum, not just this part though, is labeling what you're doing, right? So when it's time for Let's Find Out About It, Tell the kids that that's what you're doing. We're gonna come to all together and we're gonna find out about it. And the more you do that, the more excited they're gonna say, because they're gonna start to connect that when we're all together at Let's Find Out About It, she's gonna show me something amazing that's about to blow my mind that I never, you know what I mean? And the more you sell it and the more excited you get about, we're finding out about something new, this is a new concept, we read about this in the book, let's bring it further. They're really gonna start to, and so by unit three, four, five, it gets longer. It might not just be 10 minutes. You might start to push the 20, 21, 22 minute mark, but they're engaged and they're responding. And like Melissa said, they're giving you ideas of how to chart, how to graph, um, comparing and contrasting. And I don't want to put words in their mouths, but I've seen in other classrooms, come unit four, five, six, they're starting to say, hey, that's just like when we read Peter's chair back in unit one. They're starting to connect how what they learned in September has now grown to this concept in May, and it's like goosebumps. It's amazing what they connect to. So, so don't limit yourself. This is a 10 minute activity. Oh no, we're getting into 12 minutes. We need to finish this up. If they're engaged and, they're, and everything's running as smoothly, keep going. Um, the opposite of that is true too. If you thought this was gonna take 15 minutes and it's a flop, end it, right? Don't make them stay there. <laughs> and you'll see that as you get into the units, like you said, like in the first couple units, most of the resources are photographs or videos or books to share because that's what's appropriate for them at that time of the year. And now we're getting into unit three and maybe it's an experiment as a group. Maybe it's a little more hands-on. Um, they're going to be exploring what air moves in small groups. They do it and let's find out about it. They build block structures in the block center um, that have to be stable. And then my assistant runs around with a hair dryer so I'm trying to knock them over. <laughs> um, some teachers use a fan on like the upstairs photos. So I always point over here, like she's here, but I know she's tweeted out. So <laughs> she's over <laughs> there. Okay. Um, you're talking about pinwheels and kites and umbrellas. And when you talk about umbrellas, you're exploring items that repel and absorb water. Uh, big words, but it's okay to use big words with kids. They understand it. Um, sinking and floating. So experimenting with various items and then making a class chart or graph. And that's that same idea as when I do what does air move. I have a bucket of water. I have my items. It's a clear bucket so that they can see the water and whether or not the item sinks or floats. And they are so excited when they walk in the room after special 
and I am sitting in front of a bucket of water. They sit right down and they're like, what is she going to do with that? Um, animal baby care, which refers to rabbits and raindrops in this unit, and all the way back to crybaby in the first unit, um, and kind of comparing how do animal parents take care of their babies, and how do they take care of the baby and crybaby. Uh, living things that need water, you'll be reading Bringing the Rain to Puppy and Clean. That's one of my favorite books in our curriculum. Um, and Living Things Need Water. How animals prepare for winter. You're talking about shelter and food and migration and hibernation. And once you say the word shelter to them, they will not stop saying it. Um, and they talk about it at home. Like, you know, Joey came home last night. He's like, this is our shelter. Let's go into the shelter. Um, and they're building it in the block center. Uh, let's see, camouflage the animals. We, there is a Habitat app on our iPad where they can look for the camouflaged animals. Uh, dressing for winter. And then after this one, I always put a dressing bear in our manipulative center um, and just kind of let them continue to explore dressing the bear for different seasons and weather. We do we explore melting and do an investigation of that. We talk about winter activities, the things you can do in winter in Maine. Skiing, snowshoeing, sledding, building snowmen, and then we get outside and we do it. We have snowshoes, so we have had the opportunity to do that. And then they are helping you prepare for the showcase of learning. I've saved all their work in general, but they might say, you know, I'm really proud of this thing I did. I'd like to show this at the showcase of learning. They can make signs welcoming their families. Any questions? Marcy? I have a question for you. Sure. Um, the question is, due to limited funds and that sort of thing of purchasing new materials, are there books that you would recommend that are more important to purchase than others? Yep, the core text. Even if you just got one copy and maybe took out a second copy from the library, um, the core text I think are the most oh, important. Because yeah. yeah. you can find some of these other books on YouTube that you can show them um, if you needed to. But mm -hmm. for text, yeah, and we have when we navigate the website, we'll show you where that is. Where that list is. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so here is a photo of the showcase of learning in my classroom from our pilot year. Um, so all of my children had a black poster board, and I fixed any work I saved from that child on that board, including a self-portrait and how they wrote their name and. Their families came in and they just walked around the classroom looking at the work. Um, this year, we left school literally the day um, our showcase of learning was supposed to be that night, and so it was canceled. But I made a video of the sailboat experiment we had done, and we set that on. So in Unit 4, you are exploring map making, which you'll do several more times throughout the rest of the year. Um, so the first maps will probably look like lines that don't go anywhere, but by the end of the year, they can really look like a map that you can probably follow to wherever it is the child likes to take you. Um, you're talking about color fading and experimenting with fading color paper, so we'll paint the color paper in the window, and then we'll make color paper not in the sunlight, and check back in with that a couple days later and see other stuff happens. Um, you're talking about washable and permanent colors, traffic lights and signs, which always turns it into the green light of the sign. You're talking about tinting and shading, which you saw in the stairs photograph or someone. Um, of one activity you can do where the color is getting lighter by adding white or getting darker by adding black. Um, talk a lot about portraits and creating puzzle portraits. Um, similar and different, which refers back to the color of the box and all of the different colors that we are here in the world. Creating paint and naming your colors with your names. Bird beats, because we're reading Lion and Little Red Bird. And distinguish the colors of the That's good. We were just commenting on the title. We, we, we like the line in the little red room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, 
I like a lot. I like all the focus in the unit. I think it is a, this, this is, is a, a fun, fun unit. unit. Yeah. And, and um, typically, typically my spring issue, like, like coming into March, March and, and whatnot. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, and there's that look in a couple previous units that get longer, but then these ones are shorter again. Yeah. Nice little, you can get more in depth vocabulary in the plots of the story. So here is one sample of a map. We made a map inspired by Rosie's walk. And he says, hers leaving the chicken and coop to here. And the fox slashed into the water and then the fox got her. The chicken said, And this is her. And this is the fox. So what I provided to them was various shapes. We said, I think shapes here. We've been exploring that in centers for a while. And just a little cut out from the book. Any I'm good. Okay. So in unit five, you'll be exploring it's all about shadows and reflections. So that's what we're doing. You'll find out about it. You'll explore reflections and noticing the differences between reflective and non-reflective items. I did this on Zoom. It was one of my kids' favorite Zooms. I heard from all my parents that they loved that day Zoom. And I really just had a collection of the different items, and they helped sort them. It was so simple. And so that was easy to transfer into remote learning, and I needed to do it. I'm talking about sources of light, natural versus artificial light. Where does the light come from? Why is this so important? Um, clear and blurry reflections, reflections in shadows, nocturnal and diurnal animals. Um, you're looking at shadows, and you're reading Yes to Shadow. You're um, being introduced to shadow puppets. Um, I'm talking about transparent and translucent. Um, I'm talking about opaque, transparent, translucent again. So you're introduced to the time before, and then you're talking about it more so. Your sorting objects that are opaque, translucent, or transparent, and then creating a glass chart. You're talking about reflections on the surface and stained glass. Um, museum collections, which refers back to the puzzle we have, where we collect and make different collections throughout the story. Uh, they make collections at home, they can form a collection in the classroom, they can label those collections. Maybe you want to make a collection like a museum and invite your administrator in the museum. And then how is light helpful? That should say light is helpful. Um, and you're reading a story called Night Job and referring back to nocturnal animals and light Okay, so that's just a little bit about unit five. Um, is you're exploring what seeds need to grow. You're reading the Nancy Bob Martin, so if you're a fact that, you will be planting seeds at some point in the summer, so the garden and our kids have a foundation of what the seeds need. You're talking about the garden design, preparing for gardens, Chinese calligraphy, which is in the title of the year, but I like that. <laughs> um, and they have a lovely little Desert gardens, edible eggs, and introducing them to oviparous animals. Because then you'll talk about oviparous animals and you'll read chickens on the only ones. And then you'll be talking about that. What are they saying? I think there was a mom who came up. There might be some mom's like two that you can make with them. I don't remember what it is. That we use the first year. Um, wheels and tires, because you know when you make it with that thing, because there's cars, there's a truck in the street. So we talk about wheels and tires and how to get something from one thing to another, and then we're building ramps, and then we're working in some of the foundational physics experiments. Um, you're building bridges, and then I add those materials to the centers, or to the art centers, and then you build them. Um, life cycle drawing, so you might talk about the butterfly life cycle, although I will say that we do that in the fall. We grow butterflies, probably like many of you already do. Um, 
and other spring animals like we talked about frog and other insects. And you're looking at free pay now. So you're getting a resource for you to buy bonds and clicker. It's just about a way for those apps to be able to, you know, down. We can get ready to go to the And it's more of how much we throw in there over the year. And then as part of the treatment, you're doing research on the hidden garden. And what is that like? And we visit the classroom and we write down our observations and we share with each other what is it like going to the garden. Visit with other teachers. I think, yes. So here's Chinese delivery. So I just have some samples of what that looks like. And anybody introduced it? We really need to eat the vegetables, the mother labels for garden in Chinese delivery. And so she's trying to help. She stayed there that whole center. Are there any other questions? I feel like it's a fairly simple component, effectively, because um, a lot of the time you might just be showing photos and talking about it, but sometimes you really can get into the concepts of your story. Um, do you have any tips for tips for getting parents on board with this type of learning? It was found especially challenging during remote learning. They still wanted worksheets, not a lot of activities. Um, that's right. And she did typically send home letters to introduce each unit. Yep. So, like getting on board is play based learning? Is that what you mean? Like not what she's? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. Welcome to early childhood. So, we are the advocates, right? We know that children learn through play, but not everyone really understands what can really happen with play. And so, I personally think it's my job to educate those who don't know. You know, it's my job to help my administrator understand when he walks in my classroom, it looks like play, but here's really what they're learning. Here are the standards they're meeting. That's how I advocate for play. I do send home, I never had families um, complain about the curriculum, but um, I do send home notes about what we're learning, um, vocabulary that we're using, I think because the children go home and they're using the vocabulary and talking about what they're doing and they're excited that our families haven't really um, complained. I understand um, kind of that direct instruction, academic, sitting down to do a worksheet looks really interesting, <laughs> um, but it's not best practice and we know that. So I think you just have to educate your families on why that's so. In a lot of cases, too, it doesn't take long for the parents to see the progress that the kids are making with this type of curriculum. So that is. Yeah, that's true. We do a fall conference and we do a spring conference. Those are scheduled into our school year because they're required. So administrators, just be aware that you will need to make sure that those days are scheduled in your school calendar for your pre-paid teachers to have coverage to do conferences with their families. And by November, when we do that conference, then here's where they are in September when they walk in, and here's where they are now. I think if anyone's doubting it, that'll turn it around because there's so much growth in that first few months. Yeah, yeah I think um, my response to that, in addition to what you have just said, because I totally agree. That's a great question. What was the question, Melissa? Is there certain lingo that you're using, like she was saying, horizontal line, vertical oh. line? Um, I believe that is how it's written in the curriculum when you do it. Um, uppercase, lowercase, right? Uppercase and lowercase, all of those, those words are in the curriculum. Um, I had to get in the habit because I'm trained in handwriting without tears, so I had to really refer to the curriculum a lot to make sure I was saying the right words. Um, but yeah, all that's right in the lesson plan as you go to play that game. Or any of the games that use those, that language. Good question, Pam. <laughs> um, so let's talk about math. Um, something that's really important to know about math is that it is integrated into the whole unit. Your children aren't sitting down and doing math worksheets. They are learning math all the time. Um, 
you want to say anything more about the facts? I know you really wanted to emphasize. Well, I just wanted, yeah, to show because like Boston, for example, um, did not write math into their curriculum. They wrote their curriculum, but then they substitute with oh, building, building blocks, um, which is a whole separate evidence-based curricula um, that you would purchase. So part of our work in Maine, when we were revamping Boston to be pre-K for me, we wanted to incorporate the math within it. So districts did not need to purchase a separate curriculum um, similar to what we were talking about yesterday, like with Jolly Phonics, if your district is using a math curriculum that they want to be implemented in pre-K, then you would substitute these activities for those activities. Um, you wouldn't necessarily need to do both. That's way too much. Um, but if your district is just implementing pre-K for me in its full glory, then there is no need to add any other supplemental curriculum like Jolly Phonics, Handwriting Without Tears, Building Blocks, anything. Um, it's all incorporated, so. And it was written um, by a Maine pre-K teacher, Jodell Austin. She teaches in South Portland. She's a phenomenal teacher. Um, and I know for a fact that she would be more than happy to answer any of your math questions because um, she, this is her heart and soul. This is her baby. She wrote this um, so she could answer any question far better than me. And in fact, if you ask me, I'm happy to put you in touch with her <laughs> because she, like I say, she's going to know the reasons why um, lessons are the way they are or are embedded the way they're embedded. And would likely welcome you to go visit. Yes. Uh, and I, and I would, would highly encourage you to do that. She, yeah, she has a fantastic program she's down there. She's very natural at it, the yeah. way she works at then. Yeah, yeah it's fun. Um, and then also, I'll just throw in real yeah. quick, this afternoon we'll be talking about um, the outdoor learning component of the curriculum. And Patty Bailey, um, this professor from UMF, will be joining us at 1 o'clock via Zoom to talk to us about that. So um, that's later for, for right yeah. now. Um, so you're doing math in small groups, and so today we're going to talk about doing math as a large group, which you're doing once a week during your large group activities. So the overall goal of the math curriculum that was developed for pre-K for me is to create a strong foundation for mathematical thinking and learning, which they will need for school success throughout all of their learning years. Um, it presents math concepts and skills in a way that is engaging, developmentally appropriate, and sequential. So you're building on skills as the year goes on. It integrates the main early learning and development standards into all unit goals and objectives. Um, so the assumptions and approach um, for those who wrote the math curriculum, all children are natural mathematicians. Learning should be accessible for all learners. Being able to problem solve using mathematical thinking skills and tools is essential for school success. Experiential active learning is the basis for all learning activities, and math is integrated into other learning within the unit. So what is learned um, along the developmental pathways of the MELTS? You are exploring mathematical practices, counting and cardinality, numbers and operations, geometry, measurement and data, problem solving, and math communication. And then, of course, I always throw photos in just to show samples. This was a small group activity, and we are playing shape and color bingo. You're approaching me. Do you have something to add? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so you're learning math through experiential hands-on learning, multi-sensory diverse experiences throughout the six units, purposefully integrated across the curriculum, there's whole group math activities and small group math activities. And what she's doing here is using the beans or seeds to measure the line and then counting how many it took to do that. So some non-standard activity. Um, so here are a few of math learning photos from our classroom. Um, so in this small group, they are rolling the dice counting the dots to know how many, and then using the spinner to know which color 
and how many links to add to their chain. Um, when I first did this activity, their chains were pretty short. Once they had the hang of it, I'm asking them to make a chain as long as your arm, make a chain with a partner, make a chain as long as the table, and then I always put this in manipulatives because they love this activity and they will do it every day. Um, over here, he is sorting beautiful stuff, and this was a math activity he's doing naturally during hunters without any prompting. So this is a small group activity where he has a number card and there's dots and you're putting that number of blocks and that number of bears. So one-on-one -on -one correspondence, he's recognizing the number or counting the dots. If he doesn't recognize the number, and then counting out the tools he needs to match the number. She is sorting shapes and being very silly. <laughs> um, she's very proud that she did that. Um, another thing they did with the shapes was sorting by color. Um, for another child who did that activity, I only had two columns because it only offered two separate shapes so that she could learn how to do that. She was able to do so you can differentiate it as you need to according to the skills of your children. So this is a small group game where they roll the dice or you could draw a number card, count or recognize the number and then add that many monkeys to the link. At the end, they were singing Five Little Monkeys, which is one of our school songs. And she is beating and making a pattern. We do a lot of beating in my classroom easy fine motor. Most of my children come in needing fine motor and I do it every day. Some sort of fine motor progressive activity. We do a lot of measurement, both with non-standard tools and with this tool. So they could measure and then document what did you measure and draw a picture. Isabel measured Ms. Brown's arm and how long was it? It was 20. Um, you know, she didn't understand, you know, she doesn't understand inches or centimeters. I use the language. She doesn't need to write it, um, but she recognized the 20 and she wrote that on her paper. During remote learning, I created a seesaw similar activity and she measured her daddy's muscles and they were 100. So, <laughs> I think that was my favorite video. Um, this is something that they spontaneously did during centers grabbing the Unifix cubes and measuring the table and shape pictures. This was something that was done during center. She sorted and labeled by color the magnetic letters and we do a lot of charting and graphing. And I try to keep it as simple as possible. I might use green for yes and red for no or dots so that you can really see the green is yes and red is no. Um, here I just wrote float and sing. Here's a color graph, which I think you do after dog's colorful day. And we just use the sticky dots. I think it is what color you are wearing that day. This graph is from Jesse's classroom. So what color are you wearing? And they could choose the color dot and put it up there. And then you're really looking at it at the end of the week. What are the colors we wear the most? What are the colors we wear the least? Um, here they're making patterns. Another graph, how many people are in your family? This is another small group activity with, that goes along with Dog's Colorful Day, which is a cortex. So they draw a card from the pile in the middle and put the colored dot on the dog. So, they put it on the graph. So they are like they're working on 10 frames here as well without even doing it. Um, <laughs> they pick a color and they'll put it on the graph. If they pick uh, the same color, then they'll put it back. There are also um, dog wash. Yeah, dog wash card where it's in the tub because at the end of the book, they wash all of the same dogs. Um, so if they pick that, they have to wash away their last color and get that back. Yes, and then you're getting in. There will be a winner of the game, and the rest of them are not winners. And 
most of the time we handle that pretty well by this time of the year, but I had a couple who didn't and we worked through that and talked about it. That's also a really good I'm sorry, opportunity to teach them good sportsmanship. After every time we play, we won't be able to do this yet, but we would shake hands and say good game. So good job, job. congratulations. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then this is during centers. He is, you know, she has a telephone and some writing materials and some number cards. He's writing the phone on numbers. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions about large group math? A lot of your, um, your small group math activities will transfer well over into the manipulative center. There were a lot of times where our time just ran up those numbers and the kids were really liking what we're doing. Um, so at the end of the three day vacation, our kids put that right into the manipulative center. Um, some other large group games, some of the large group games that we played, um, when you read corduroys, he loses his button. And so you have some buttons that you'll hide around the room and they'll go find the buttons and tell you, I found this above or below or under or behind and you're using those positional words to describe where they found it. Um, another game was talk to bee bags. Um, it seemed like if you could get it into a certain point and then counting them, like how many did you get inside the hoop, how many did you get outside the hoop, cheering for the person who's doing it. Um, they, all 16 of them will sit there and wait their turn. They love that game. Mm -hmm. We play that a few times. Melissa, do you do calendar? I do not. What? Are you trying to fight with me? No. <laughs> um, I did calendar until two years ago. Um, there's no calendar. You're not counting a calendar. Um, there's, you know, there's no circle time really. And no oh, math is worked. Yeah, math is worked into your day. You don't really need it. I count a lot to 20 with um, rope counting um, throughout the day because the first year I found. That was the one standard that they were either exceeding or they were not yet meeting, but they were approaching. And so it's introduced later in the year as a, you know, as is appropriate. And for most of my students that works for their development and they meet that standard, but some of them need more processing time to learn that skill. So I just count, I count when we're waiting in line. I count when we're in a transition. I count all day long for the only the math thing I can think of that I add in that may not necessarily be prompted by the curriculum. Yeah. No. Anything else that you want? I was assuming that the calendar work is Yes, I even that. Do you want to repeat that? Yes, I do want to repeat it. The question was, is calendar work introduced in kindergarten? And I'm actually not sure because we use K for me. Do they do a calendar? So I think, I don't know, K for me does not have calendar the way we're sort of accustomed to seeing it, like as a daily routine, depending on what math curriculum they have, because math is not written into the kindergarten curriculum. Um, then they're made calendar. It's appropriate to have a calendar in your classroom and talk about dates, you know, and, and so-and-so's birthday or a home day and a school day or weekends or holidays and to show the concept of what a calendar is right whether that's on display for the whole class in a whole group setting or um, like an actual flip calendar that we're used to in dramatic play perhaps or near a teacher's space that's fantastic but the the curriculum doesn't lend itself to that daily routine of yesterday, today, tomorrow, you know, counting and things like that. Because if you think about, I mean, like you were saying, the standard of counting, rope counting to 20 is an end of pre-K standard. But yet in September with the calendar, we're asking them to count to 30. And that's just not, you know, always by nine or 10, uh, 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 30, uh, you know, they're, they're, dra they're slagging off, right? They're not quite getting it. And also with that said, you know, come May, if you're typically doing calendar, it's so common for the teacher to say, it's a new month, what month is it? And then Monday, and it's like, nope. <laughs> you know, that those concepts, they're, they're not quite grasping it. Some children will, 100%. There's always those children that 
get it and run with it and they know the answer to every question. Um, but it's not a concept that's appropriate yet for them to truly grasp and understand. And a lot of time is spent um, in so many classrooms trying to embed this in children's just rote remembering. And it's, there's so many other ways we could be spending our time and encouraging the concept without making it a whole group let's stop and start over and you know we weren't all together and you know these routines that we find ourselves falling into we um, like don't need another whole group activity to support them and they're already so much time when you're coming together as a whole right. group and asking them to sit and be engaged there's right. no point in adding something that's developmentally inappropriate for them anyway right i would say probably maybe seven I think it's good. Yeah, they're good. Yeah. yeah, I have a really good article that I share around that too. And a lot of teachers still, I don't know if you do or not, um, do a morning message. And that's a great spot to say, good morning. Today is Monday. It's August 3rd, 2020. We have an exciting day planned. I can't wait to see what we learn. Love, Miss Melissa, or whatever. Um, you know, so there, that know, language is important. That yeah. At my morning message is verbal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good morning. Right. Good. Yeah, we want to be using that vocabulary. We want to be using that language um, just in much more intentional ways. Sorry, I'm going to I do have a question. Um, are differentiating strategies offered in the curriculum? Differentiating strategies offered within the curriculum? Yeah, individualizing activities and, and that sort of. I'm I assume that's what you're talking about. Do we want to maybe bring up a lesson sure. plan to share at your computer? We can. And you get bonus points if you find one that does have differentiating strategies. <laughs> so I, I would argue that every lesson has its opportunity to individualize the instruction to whatever needs you have in your classroom. Whether or not it's written on there. Mm -hmm. They all have a provocation. Right? A provocation. She said, and they all have a provocation as well, which is a way to extend or um, further the learning and activity that you did within that lesson. Although I would say if this is your first year using pre-K for me, do not stress about doing the provocations, just do the curriculum piece. So the entire pre-K for me curriculum is housed on the DOE's website. So the, the website is easy, it's just main.gov slash DOE. Um, you can do slash home, but it'll bring you there regardless. So this is our web, our main page, main landing page of the whole DOE. There's a ton of resources and a ton of links that um, anybody can navigate through on here, especially since the COVID closure. Um, the framework for schools is here, resources for schools are here, resources for parents is here. So if you do have time to kill and you wanna navigate, um, this is a good spot to do that. But for today's purposes to get to where we wanna be under teaching and learning, You'll see all of our um, content areas pop up. So clearly we're early childhood education. So this is just gonna bring you right to our early education homepage. Okay. So this is gonna look at some public preschool specifics like chapter 124, um, applying for a pre-K program, et cetera. Our Head State Start, <laughs> okay, Nicole. Head Start State Collaboration Office is housed at DOE. That's Nina Cunningham. Um, her site and information is here. Below that is pre-K for me, and that's what you want. So it shows up wonky on my computer because, I'll show you how it shows up wonky down here, see? Um, because I use the um, Google Chrome web browser. I think if you use, depending on your browser, it'll appear. Yeah. <laughs> um, but let me scroll back to the top. So there's some information um, around how the work was developed. Over in the right-hand column is um, who we're acknowledging for their work in this project. Um, so a few of their names have come up during this. And then towards the center as you're scrolling down, this is where you'll find a lot of um, more general resources for the curriculum. So the guiding documents, which... Um, That'll be all the information in the Senate that you've learned the past two days. So if you get home and you think, I really want to review the information from Relapse. Go to the guiding documents and okay. it will provide that for you. I think the only thing not in there is storytelling and story acting. But and small groups, which I need to add. <laughs> she'll add small groups. Thank you, Jesse. Um, but you understand what storytelling is. The child tells you a story and then you guys act it out as a group. Right. 
Um, and then also over here on the right hand side are the guidance videos I briefly mentioned yesterday. So to back up what Melissa was just saying, if you are looking for further guidance around, for example, read alouds, then you could watch this one hour video um, where we're discussing this component only. Um, and there's how to navigate the website, thinking and feedback in small groups, Swipple and math, and let's find out about it. Um, so like I said, these are not necessarily training videos, they're just added guidance. Um, and the training videos from yesterday and today will be added to here as well. So some other resources that you're going to want to know and love. I don't want to get into these quite yet because I don't want to get off task of what the question that we we're trying to answer, but we'll come back here. Um, these are going to be important for you to access. And then there's the map. So every unit is highlighted by its label and a picture. So unit one, family, friends, unit three, wind and water, four, world of color, five is shadows and reflections, and six is things that grow. So I'll just try and see. If go to, I found one on unit. Oh, perfect. Which one was it? What um, unit? If we go to unit one and writing room and family name. So unit one, is that our writing center? Yes. Okay. We'll navigate this a little better. I'm still just looking. Say, yeah. You can do this slower and clearer. Okay, right here? So this is a lesson plan um, in unit one, week one, writing my name and family names. It's a writing center activity and it goes along with Peter's chair. So as you scroll down, you'll see that there's all the materials you'll need for the lesson, the vocabulary that we're going to be specifically focusing on as we interact with students and as we read the story, some preparation notes. So based on the child's ability, you can decide whether you use first name only, both first and last name, um, upper and lower case or all upper case, um, a lot of the other writing lessons or math lessons, you can choose whether you use numbers one through 10, numbers one through three, one through five. Um, so it's not always completely written out like this, but there's definitely a lot of movement to support your learners, whether um, it's using less letters, less numbers, or adjusting it um, based on their needs. Thank you for finding that one. Um, a note for you all, when you open up a link on the site, never X out of it, because it'll X you out of the whole site. Always just go back. Hard habit to learn. Okay, so let me go back to just the main pre-K for me site, the home page of it. Great to hear it. Do you recommend printing a hard copy of the curriculum or just using the online access? So the question is, do we recommend printing a hard copy of the curriculum or just using the online resource? I print the first three units and then I use the online. I like to, at the beginning of the year, have it right in front of me the whole time for planning because I'm not just dealing with the curriculum but getting them settled into school. I don't want to have to hop on my computer and navigate the website to get the info I need. I have it right there. Um, I print mine um, and then I keep whatever week I'm working on in a separate binder so I don't have my big unit yeah, binder okay. to carry it's around. It's big. <laughs> so I take out a week at a time and I just put my printed copies in plastic sleeves and then keep it in a binder. And then I just have, you know, week one of unit one. When I'm done with that week, I put it into my unit binder and take out week two so that I have it. Um, yeah, I, I love the binder. We, the first year we had bound copies, but the binder's nice because I can just take out the papers that I want to use. Yeah. Um, I keep the resources in clear sleeves so that I can take those out. I show them to the children. I post them up in centers. Um, I think we all do it a little bit differently, so it really is your personal preference. Yeah. I keep my, I print mine out print out what I know I'm going to use and I keep it in a folder so at the end of each day I have for the next day I have all of my papers I'm going to use for the next day. But yeah I really think it's how you organize. Yeah. yeah each unit if you were to print it each unit is about a ream of paper so it's huge. Um, 
it's, it's actually, yeah. yeah. I mean, when we were piloting, we printed them for all the um, piloting teachers, but moving forward, the department is not responsible for doing any of that, so that would be up to you to in your district if you wanted to do that. Yeah, yeah Nicole, when we were looking at pilot we said mm -hmm. our teachers were all posting them up on Office July. We had that and full board. Yes. But it's, it's what board. they needed. Yeah. yeah. They happy to do it. And, yeah. They're huge. And, and for some teachers, maybe there's just certain components you want printed. Right. Okay. Not but I think so. to start, yeah, to learn that, I think you want it printed. Yeah, great. Thank you. Will the curriculum always remain free? Will the curriculum always remain free? Yes. That I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the department will not charge for any use. It's open source. I mean, you're in charge. You, the district or their classroom, is responsible for purchasing books, materials, equipment. Um, if you're a brand new pre-K classroom in a district and it hasn't existed there before, then that's where a large chunk of the expense is going to come up. <laughs> I'm looking at my new classrooms over there, and they because you just don't have those materials and books on hand. If you're a pre-K classroom that's been in existence and you're looking to change and implement this curriculum instead of what you were doing previously, then most of the materials and equipment you should already have. Um, so if you look on the website here, halfway down over on the right, material and book list, this is gonna give you a really good idea of what it takes to fully implement every unit, every activity, etc. So, if I was one of those programs that has been in existence, but now I'm switching over, then just taking a look at any one of these documents, you could probably pretty easily check off items that you already have. Um, so for example, blocks, right? The wooden unit blocks is really what we recommend. Some schools don't have the wooden ones. They have the foam ones or the old cardboard brick ones from my pediatrician's office. And those aren't going to suffice, quite honestly. I mean, they won't and they won't last. Um, and, you know, I, I've heard every reason as to why districts don't want the wooden ones, but you've just got to invest in the wooden ones. It's what you're going to get for your money and for the true um, purpose of blocks and block building. The wooden unit blocks are really the best. So just to give people a sense of cost, the furniture, all of it, we can really play things, which is outstanding. Mm, yeah, and high quality. All of the materials to support two programs up and running about twenty five to twenty seven thousand for everything. Yeah, for two classrooms. That's separate from you know staff fees and transportation costs. That's yes. just curriculum and furniture. Yeah. So yeah, so Christine was saying in a brand new classroom that's. Um, looking to purchase all of these things. They purchased it all through community place things, which is gonna be of high quality materials for two classrooms to outfit. Um, they were looking at about twenty-five dollars to $27,000, which is right there, because we typically say a brand new classroom from scratch is about 15,000. Um, so for two, you're looking at about 30, right there. That included all the books, videos, blocks, yep. videos. Yep. Um, but like these dramatic play items, right? So typically programs have some type of kitchen, some type of table, some type of dramatic play clothing, things like that. Um, so you could go through here and just highlight what it is that you need or what it is that you want to replace. I think another big piece to consider is the amount of the tools you'll go through. Yeah. Um, so the paper, the popsicle sticks, the basket tape, everything that the cards and caps you can <laughs> Yep. You go through paint. Can I, with, with that, Jesse, were you all going through screens of old reviews and search of emails? How did you manage all the unanticipated costs? Um, I mean, for us, it was different because you pilot it off the grant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to those things. Um, but I know some of the materials can be found at Boots Reusable. And um, okay. uh, no, there was one unit that we did in all fall in our school and just asked them, this is what pre-K if you have it and you're not using it, you want to donate to our yeah. as fast as you can, and we got a huge for, for some yeah. activities like beautiful stuff that are being used in class for parents to send in bottle caps or when we make sailboats, we save our milk cartons for the week and we just rinse them out and use them right. for our sailboats. So there are some reusable options in some scenarios, but um, I mean, stuff like needle tape or that's just stuff. You'll be replacing that every year. But when it comes to 
to the, like the big ticket items, it does benefit you to purchase high quality materials because that got gets used and it's going to last. I mean, we're on our well, we've gone through two years of using our um, schematic clay and the wooden blocks, and they're still like yes, yes. yes. So, so you want to, as a district, commit to building a $20,000, $15,000, $20,000 prepay room because you're not going to have to do that again for that, right? And they're implementing this incredible curriculum. You're going to go. So I had no idea. My dad is retired, but he's working at the hardware store in Wells. And they literally, hardware stores throw out their seats. And he's like, I think my dad is something about prepay. <laughs> <laughs> But it may be worth checking in your local yeah. Aubuchon, how yes. we throw them out. Yes. And right. my dad grabbed about 100 packs of them. And there's a uh, paint chip activity. Yes. Yeah. So, so those those paint cards, yeah, sample cards, cards right. are used um, during our color unit. So if you can get those for free, you know, it's like yeah. that they're just throwing away that they don't use anymore. But he was so excited that they told me I could have them and they were going to throw them out. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great for discovery. Yeah, and there's almost always a community um, provider or construction guy that ha you know whatever that's happy to put together a dramatic place sink or to put or give you scraps of wood for blocks or whatever. Um, I can't tell you how many classrooms I've been in while monitoring and talking to them about wooden blocks and and how great and um, as budget allows add this to your program. And then the administrator in the room is on a handful of times has said, I think I have a set of that in the basement in storage. And the teacher had no idea, right? I'm like, go get the wooden blocks on store, right? So sometimes these things already exist in districts and storage rooms and basements and attics um, that you could paw through. And it's not uncommon. Um, I lovingly call them yard sale classrooms, right? Teachers do their best in this time of year. We'll go to yard sales and get puzzles and get um, materials or equipment or dramatic play clothes, right? That's okay. I, I don't know right now necessarily, <laughs> but um, goodwill. goodwill, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I don't want teachers to spend their hard-earned money on these things, but if it's something that um, is going to enhance the curriculum or that your district can work with you on, you know, high quality is great, but in the grand scheme of things, sometimes we just need to do what we can do. So this materials and book lists link um, brings you to this Google page and there's specific math books, math materials. It goes by unit by unit, um, which of those, like these are bigger lists, but then they are broken down by unit. When you're doing your purchasing, it's a good idea to buy storage things as well. We have our, um, like our unit, Sarah has her unit one bin right there. So I have your name and your name, right? <laughs> it's going to go into, it's beneficial. It's at the end of unit one, I put my baby dolls in there. Um, if they come out again, I'll go grab them out of storage, but you're doing so many other things in that center that they don't usually. Yeah, you won't need all the baby, baby bottles. Right. And so, so to be able to tuck that away, yeah. into a bin and then just keep it. So your free pay teachers may need a place to store those bins because they're going to stay. They tuck, and if you have two new classrooms in a school, that's full tuck. Um, <laughs> so ours is just in an empty room. Even empty room in your school. Another link that I just clicked on was the, a visual list of the books. So yeah, by unit, so this is like your unit one for read alouds. Um, some of them we talked about through the course of the last day and a half. Some of these you may already have in your collection. Corduroy, Peter's Chair, The Hello Goodbye Window. I mean, these were favorites. Um, when I was in the classroom as a teacher as well that were part of my library. Um, some other supplemental texts that you'll be using in Let's Find Out About It or Swipple. Marcy, did you have a question? I, do. Um, I think I actually have Polaroid in some questions. Um, I think it's Yeah, I have a couple from the chat room. I have two. Um, so Jesse asked, given that we'll most likely need to make choices about what to teach and what not to teach this year, do you have any guidance to offer on what units, standards, or activities might be prioritized? So there are some non-negotiables that we talk about um, 
when doing this, specifically around, or in the past it's come up because programs operate so differently, half day and full day. So there are daily non-negotiables and then there are sort of like maybe weekly non-negotiables. And when I say that, what I'm talking about is the components, right? So regardless of how many hours a day your program runs, your read aloud, your intro to centers and your centers need to be happening every day. Those are non-negotiables. So if we're looking at a remote re-entry, then there are ways to incorporate read aloud and centers. I would probably turn to you because again, you, got, you guys have skin in the game and I don't. Um, the read aloud piece could be easy. There's um, some things to be aware of around copyright issues. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend videoing yourself or let me take that back. I wouldn't recommend recording yourself reading a story and having it available like on YouTube. Instead, I would do it in a live format, like in a Zoom, um, because publishers um, they had some concerns around copyright. In the spring, they were very kind and let a lot of that go um, and said that teachers could record themselves and house it in a digital format, but then asked that they be deleted once things settle down. So moving forward, Quite honestly, I don't know where they're at with that. So my recommendation would be to try and do it in a live format if possible. Um, or some of these might be available by the author reading them on YouTube or by a publisher reading them on, on a YouTube video. Those would be fine to link to. Um, how did, oh yeah, <laughs> oh, it was a lot of line. Um, did you do, guys do anything around centers or read alouds remotely that you found worked or didn't work? Um, so I think, we each tackled it, not completely differently, but I would make a video reading of the first and second read, and my students would watch the video, and then I would do the third read on Zoom, and kind of assess for comprehension and understanding, and really diving into the plot and characters. Um, I think we, all did, we were required to do you know, certain things every day in remote learning. We did read aloud, we did a math activity, a literacy activity, um, we met with them on Zoom, they, we used Seesaw, and that's how we created our center activities was through Seesaw. So if the center activity it was dramatic play and you're building the lion's cave from Lion and the Little Red Bird, I created a Seesaw activity where they essentially built a blanket fort at home and colored pictures to decorate their cave and then shared videos or photos of that with me through Seesaw. So, there was a measuring activity, then um, I just sort of left, left it open so that their unit of measurement could be Legos they had at home or whatever right. they shoes, shoes right. whatever they have available <laughs> in that um, when something in your house to measure, send me a video of what you're measuring. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. So um, I did I did a Zoom meeting every day with my kids and we did all four reads. Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, the first two were very similar to doing them in person. The third, they got used to, they had to unmute themselves. <laughs> back up. Uh, but most of their parents were right there helping them anyway, then they got, they caught right onto it. Um, acting out the story was the hardest to do, but they still did it. Mm -hmm. They just took a little bit of use to it. But so there, it's definitely doable. Um, and when, if you are lucky enough to be working in a team, you can, I know we all made, activities on Seesaw and like if Melissa made one, I would share it to the district Seesaw page and like everyone had access to it. Yep. And kind of if I saw Jesse created that activity, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. She did a great job. I'm gonna move on to the next one and create that for the team. Um, so yeah. And so as far as returning back to in person, whether it's partial week or five days a week, whatever it is, on the site um, there's sample schedule. So like for example, this is a full day program that would be about five and a half hours. And you'll see in the black font, uh, actually, nope, I guess that's not accurate. What I was gonna say is when you get, when you know the time of your day, so in this sample, it's from 8.30 to two o'clock dismissal. So fill it for, start with your schedule by filling in what you know is a stuck time, right? So arrival, you know your kids are gonna come from eight to 8.30, it's a staggered arrival, however it looks. 
you know you can't do any part of the curriculum during that time. So right out of the gate, block out, if you can, by the minute, when things are. Lunch, rest, recess, so that you can kind of start to see your schedule already start to diminish <laughs> and in what you can implement. It's highly recommended that um, send intro to centers, read aloud, center time, um, and this sample it has thinking and feedback be done in the morning. And then in this full day program, even though they're full day, they still can't implement let's find out about it every day or small group every day or math whole group every day. So in here they have it out throughout the week. So those components, let's find out about it, um, storytelling and acting, SWIFL, those don't have to be done every day. Those are more spread out across the week. Um, in this scenario, they have SWIFL every day. So if that's something that your schedule can accommodate, perfect. They also have small groups every day. In a half day program, which is another really common example in Maine, it's a little different. So, but you'll notice they still have read aloud, intro to centers, centers, and thinking and feedback every day. Right? Oh, one day a week. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, in this particular one where their dismissal is at noon, they're able to squeeze in a let's find out about it. Um, sometimes they supplement with a social emotional curriculum like um, second step or um, uh, conscious discipline, something like that. So they might squeeze that in there. Otherwise, they've spread it out like math and small groups throughout the week. So my recommendation to teachers is always to know your program, know your start and end times, Know your other non-negotiables, recess, arrival, departure, lunch, whatever it may be, and then go in and fill it in the curriculum pieces, aiming to keep these read alouds, intro to center centers more in the morning time. In a full day program, the afternoon's a little more um, loose in terms of the academic approach. Yeah. Uh, when we do have our sample schedules, we can show you. I would just add There's another one. Also this is a three consider, other. Um, full group versus small group time. So you yes. don't want to stack back to back, read aloud, let's find out about it, swivel, because then students are sitting for right. far too long and they're spending more time. So I do have thinking and feedback and then read aloud, but between those two things, we're meeting up and doing a dance or a song from swivel or standing up. Um, so yeah, I've tried to schedule a lot of different ways during the pilot year and that's the one that works. Yeah, and year one, first implementing it, it's okay if you're not getting to the swivel, the let's find out. Do it as you can, like don't just totally erase it from your schedule, but become a pro first at the read alouds and the centers and the intro to centers and get yourself really comfortable with those aspects before you start tacking on all of these other heavy duty. And I will say pieces. it took three units for me to feel comfortable with all of the components. So. If you're feeling comfortable now, but then you get started in your school year and you're feeling overwhelmed, just know we get it and we were there. And it wasn't until unit three where I felt comfortable, which is actually probably why that unit's my favorite. Because it was the first unit I felt comfortable, I could really get into doing all the components in the way they should be done. So, so that sample schedule um, on there is it can be really helpful, knowing that times and, and different parts of your day vary. But that was right here, this sample daily schedule. And then the thinking and feedback visual aids are there as well for you to print out and laminate um, and help guide your children through that protocol. I imagine if you wanted to, you could also just put it up on your screen. Yep. Um, I like having it. Um, the school year pacing guide is one of my favorite things. So, the, I think these are 1920 school years, so you'll just have to access an updated one for your district. But this is a blank one, right? So we're, these are really familiar to us. We, we know what this is. Um, and then at the bottom, you see there's some color coding. But let me show you what it looks like in the suggested. So what we've done here is we've color coded each unit. So unit one in this scenario is red, okay? So typically, we're going back to school end of August beginning of September. And in this one, it has two weeks before they start unit one, week one, day one on September 16th. So depending on your students and how they have acclimated to your classroom, this might get pushed out. That's okay. Um, there's a resource on the Boston page. Oh, I need to pull that up too. Um, 
it's like the first six week, I forget what they call it. It's like it's the first six week it's curriculum. It's setup for success. Yes. And it's a whole document and videos um, helping you guys through those first weeks. I did put some of the information on the slideshow I created last night, uh, but we can show them how to get there because there's so much good yeah. stuff in that. So this suggested calendar shows you that unit one is one, two, three, four weeks long. This blue in between week is in this color here, the extension week. So this is where we we're mentioning um, you might take a center, um, a lesson, or something that really um, engaged the children and extend it over the course of this following week. This is also typically, I think, when if you're running in quarters, it starts to come up to a wrap, right? So it's a really good week to get caught up on assessments yeah. and things like that. Um, sometimes I will steal a day from week five and like extend, you know, we're here, we're in day one, two, three, four, five. My kids are really engaged. We want to really finish out this center or this work we've been doing. I'm going to scoop a day from week five and do a day six and mm -hmm. then start with day one again. Right. And then there's another in between week. So these are the weeks that teachers can do what they've done for years and they know and love and trust, right? So like in, I always use the example of in May around Mother's Day, teachers love to plant seeds and have the students watch the moms grow and track them. Do that, still do that. There's time, even though that's not a specific lesson particularly, there's still time in the schedule to do those tried and true activities. Um, in October, bring in the pumpkin, right? Put in the golf tees and hammer it and destroy the pumpkin in the Discovery Center. Children love that stuff. So don't skip it just because you don't think it's told to do it here. Um, there's time in the weeks to incorporate that. We typically think of pre-K programs running 35 weeks. And this is a four by six, so 24 to 30 week curriculum. So you've still got plenty of weeks to, within the year to, um, do those tried and true activities. And then like they said, there's snow days, there's interruptions, um, there might be attendance issue, who knows. Um, so having that wiggle room at, in between units is really important. And then you'll see unit two starts at the end of October, and that's here in yellow, in between weeks, then unit three, etc. I don't know how, but somehow Jesse's always ahead of me, even though we start the same time. Oh, it's because I feel the same time. You're always ahead of me. So then the individual lesson plans are going to be within the unit. So when you click on the picture, it's going to pop open. And depending on the size of the unit, the next page that you come to can look a little bit different. But for the most part, the information is the same or is trying to be organized the same. So the week by week access is your best friend. Yep. So this is going to show you we're in unit one. Week one, this is a full day schedule. This is a part day schedule. Week two, week three, week four, and then you'll see week five. There are sometimes activities yeah. in that week. Sometimes they suggest a small group or they're suggesting a large math activity. But the rest of it is open. The rest of it's open for you. Most of the time, there'll be something from that unit you didn't get to. I can't think of a unit where I didn't have to carry something into that week. And good that it's there. Right. So once you click on the unit picture and the week by week access and you figure out where you are. So we're starting at the school year, unit one, week one, and I'm a full day program. This is going to show me exactly what lessons I'm doing when. Jesse, do you want to talk about the yeah. day? Like it's not yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Tuesday. Right. So while this is based on days one through five, it's not going to fall Monday through Friday every it's so hard to get used to yeah. it. Like you're going to want to do Monday through Friday. <laughs> Even if you start okay. unit one, week one, day one, on a Monday, there might be a snow day here, <laughs> or, or maybe not in week one. <laughs> so, or maybe a school so community celebration. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Some way that we can part of something in the school. Or something so else. you'll want to do day one before you move on to day two. And if you end say Friday ends up being on day four, you're not going to start on day one on Monday, you're going to do day five on Monday. So just follow this okay. based on what you get accomplished in your classroom on day one. And if you didn't get to everything on day one, can, before you move on to these in day two, finish up day one if you need to. Because everything built on the day before and the units before. 
uh, do we maybe want to just break down like where each Oh yes, oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So on this, so this daily schedule, like I said, this is going to be something that you refer to always. Um, when you print this out for your week, across the top, of course, like Jesse just said, is your days, and then down the left-hand column here is your centers or your components. Um, so, for example, read aloud. So I know on day one, assuming perhaps that's a Monday, I'm going to do the first reading of Crybaby. And the next day, I'm going to do the first reading of Peter's Chair. And then the second reading of Crybaby. I'm going back, right? So remember yesterday during the read aloud component talk, um, the first reading is just reading it like you generally would. But the second reading, you're calling out specific vocabulary or specific definitions. And the lesson plans are very clearly labeled. If yeah. you go back to the Crybaby baby lesson plan, it will say first read, second read, third yeah. read. So I'll show you where, where that's at. And then as you're preparing your centers for the week, you know, you know, which centers are coming up. So we're going to do paper collages for three days, and then we're going to switch it to printing with objects, and that'll happen for at least two days, right? In your easel, easel is different than art studio, even though they're probably in the same space. It's a separate activity, a separate lesson. So once you know, once you have this printed out, and it's in front of you, and you want to know what the lesson plan is for, let's say, paper collages, okay? So day one art studio is paper collages. So if I go back. And I have this printed out and displayed in my classroom so that both myself and my ed tech can see every day that highlight as I do print through all this or read aloud so I'm aware of that. So all of the links here are the lesson plans, okay? So I was talking about art studio and on one of the activities in week one is paper collages. So all the lesson plans are set up generally the same. Like we said, this is, tells you what unit, what week you're in, the title, what book it's related to, and then what standards are being addressed through this lesson. All of the materials you're gonna need. Okay, so um, the book, Peter's Chair. A variety of paper, right? So tissue paper, coffee filters, construction paper, wrapping paper, etc. Um, pretty easy things to come by. Scissors, that's a staple in pre-K. Uh, variety of adhesives, so you might do glue sticks, you might want to do liquid glue, um, tape, staples, I'm not sure. I, I might not have all of those available, but use what you have access to. Um, brushes or Q-tips, little small containers to hold um, the pieces of paper, and then you're going to have some images of collages, which I can show you where to find that too. So the vocabulary you're focusing on, preparation is pretty straightforward. And will focus on that vocabulary. So I feel like I don't want mm -hmm. you guys to stress out where, you know, you're getting ready to do a read aloud. Oh, I need to pick words to, to describe them and the vocabulary words. For the most part, the script also describes those words. So don't stress about that. And the script that Melissa is referring to is during the intro to centers. Right. So when you're sitting in your whole group and you're describing what's available to students to use and you're talking about the art studio in Peter's chair as the author, as her Jack Keats used collage, which is art made by adhering, sticking, etc. So this is just giving you a guide of how you might introduce this center during intro to centers. If you continue to scroll down, it'll give you some more information around how to um, interact during the center. Samples. So one of the things I wanted to show um, the resource of paper collages. I don't see it there. Uh, but there's one for piggies or piggy banks or watercolor paintings. Yeah, but I want to know why that. I think um, in some of the lesson plans. So for example, in this printing with objects which is gonna come up in week one. See, unit one, week one, printing with objects, my standards. It'll talk about um, some of the materials that you might want is images of prints, so you can see the re resources. So back next to the lesson plan in parentheses, where appropriate, there's the resource. So this is just something that you might print out and show the students and then have in the art studio. I always do this. So there's tweaks. It's an imperfect system. <laughs> Let me know when things like this happen. 
Um, but let's see, week three, there's piggy banks and a resource photo for piggy banks. Okay, so you can, you know, do you guys use this a lot to enhance or to show modeling of yeah, what sure. they might yeah. make? Yeah, show and ones that, like, maybe watercolor, because they won't have more posting than we did the center. Watercolor painting can be free. Um, so you have the steps for watercolor painting, or I thought it would show some. But I might also show some images of watercolor mm -hmm. paintings or put those up in the art center. Right. This would be really helpful for your DLLs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, can I ask a question about your non-negotiable? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so if we went back in high red, so the two and two, which is the green light, right. strong possibility, would you recommend using like pre-K for me for the full four days and just adapting the two days of home learning the best you can through remote? Or using pre-K for me for the two face to face and then just supplementing with different types of activities for the two. Right. So Kelly's question is if we go back in a hybrid model, like two days in person, two days remote, would we recommend doing pre-K for me for all four of those and having two in person and two remote? Or doing pre-K for me for the in person, but then having something separate for remote? I know how I would answer that. Curious what you would say. I <laughs> I think that this curriculum transferred really well to Seesaw, and so I think that I would take the activities that I know would fit well in Seesaw, use those for the remote learning, and then do the other ones in person, or those really specific activities that I want to make sure that they are learning from me um, in person, to make sure that I'm doing those in person. So I would do it all four days. That would be my recommendation as well. Do you have a cheat to use activities that work well online? I mean, I can show you our seesaw activities that we've made, but we don't have. Oh no, I just thought maybe you had them. No, I would just look at it and think, you know, oh, how could they do this at home with the materials they have at home? Because I know they don't have everything they need, and I would adapt it. Yeah, we took two weeks as a team to 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 really get everything on seesaw that we needed to do. Yeah, we were most of us were, you know, halfway through unit five. So we did a read aloud, we did a literacy or a math activity, or both actually, literacy and math, whether they were centers or a song or something from Swipple. Um, I did my Swipple by Zoom with them. Uh, but some of those Swipple songs yeah. might transfer well into something they could watch. Um, I did notice, as someone who doesn't love technology, I did notice that my children who had a hard time comprehending discussions from Read Aloud um, would watch my videos over and over because they missed me and they wanted to connect with me and they thought it was actually me talking to them and would watch the Swipple videos that I would make and their comprehension was fantastic at the end of the year because they were getting it from me through Zoom and then watching the videos over and over. This was just another block resource pick or another resource picture for blocks if somebody has some questions. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm trying to wrap my head as we all are trying to wrap our heads while we're going through games this year. Um, it, it doesn't feel like we're going to be day one and two with camp right now, day three, day four and five with the other half of our class. So should we, when we start like day one, unit one, day one, with the first half of our class on Monday and Tuesday, do you, do you guys have any, like, should we carry that over through video with so in that the second half of our class? That is a different situation. Or I think we, all districts are different. <laughs> yeah, or should we be doing day one and two on Thursday and Friday with the other half of our class? I know what I, then, I would do. Like, I, I don't would, know how. Yeah. To, so the question was, if you have half your students for two days, maybe a day in between for office, yeah, off, sanitizing and whatnot, yeah. and then two with days half. with your other half of your class, I would repeat. I would repeat day one and two. Day so one and yeah, two. with that other half, and then I would create 
um, remote activities instead, I assume that's what they're doing when they're home those two days, uh -huh. um, that either support what you just did with them, the in-person. Right. Okay, okay, got it. So basically my Thursday, Friday kiddos will probably be like just the day one. They're on day one, yep. So group A comes day one and two, and then they're home. You yeah. teach them in person day one and two. You support that learning remotely through activities. You create maybe their new activities because you know they're ready. Maybe they're not. Maybe you're doing a read aloud again or making a video and building that comprehension. It really depends on your group. And this fall is going to look different than last spring. We were connected with our students already. They wanted to get online and talk to us. They were excited to do activities with us, uh, but we don't know these kiddos going in. So it'll be interesting. We're in the same boat as you guys. We have yeah. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing we'll be doing starting next week, Marcy and I, it, some of you may recall in the spring when everything shut down, the content specialists offered um, open office hours for folks to kind of come in and just talk about what's going on. Um, so starting next week, Marcy and I are going to host three times a week reopening pre-K open office hours. And it's going to be very similar in that there's not a set agenda. There's not a set discussion point. We're just going to be there to let folks come in and talk about these very things. And, it, and not necessarily pre-K for me specific, just reopening pre-K in general. Yeah, like what's working? What scenarios are people looking at? Um, I can show you real quick. So if you go back on the DOE homepage. And if there's a year not to beat yourself up about doing <laughs> yeah, it's this, this, year. Year, this is the year. So yeah. focus on, you know, learning the components and perfecting it the way that you want to. Do not stress. Right. There's so much other stuff. Um, so not to divert the whole conversation to that, but that reopening pre-K information back on the homepage here um, under resources for schools. As you scroll down, there'll be uh, right here, virtual meetings. And you can browse all of the ones that are being offered, not just for early childhood, they're all there. It takes you to a calendar, here you go. So you'll see, here we are on the fourth, the Pre-K for Me curriculum training, right? So next Monday, the 10th, is this reopening Pre-K office hours. Originally, we had thought that um, Mondays would be for zones that were categorized as green and when, uh, excuse me, Tuesdays would be categorized for yellow and Thursdays would be for those in the red, <laughs> but we're all green, so. So you might still have some operating yeah. as they are. Uh, yes, 100%. So regardless of um, the color zones, and I can go in and edit these out, it's open to anybody to join in. Um, so when you click on it in the calendar, it'll take you to um, a little more information on that. When it starts Monday the eight or Monday, excuse me Monday the tenth at ten, an opportunity to join and discuss. Da, 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 da. And it says register here. There's no registration. This link will just take you directly to the Zoom meeting. So there's no pre-registration or anything like that. If you can hop on at ten, perfect. If you can't hop on until ten twenty-five, no big deal. Um, but it's just a good way to kind of hear from colleagues around the state of what they're doing, what's working, what's not working, things like that. I would love to have childcare, Sasha and Bridget, because <laughs> you have been doing this a little longer. Um, has, have you had any scenarios that worked or didn't work for you in terms of students and distancing and hand washing or mask wearing? Or well, I'm so totally diverting the conversation. We now. We'll come back. We don't talk about mask wearing at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, So they wear masks, but then they don't, right? Well, no, so. Or they're in space. Okay. So, you have a large so literally area. Friday evening, it was mandated that we start wearing masks in a very confusing um, way. So. Otherwise, no, no, but uh, we're also outside. Right. So, no, no one was wearing masks in my school, but it was me and six kids. Yeah, yeah. And she has an outdoor learning classroom, mm -hmm. and so they're outside all the time and doing centers that way. And what I do, yeah, and what I did find just because I'm nationally accredited, um, when I reopened in June, we were already doing a lot of things that were guidance in terms of how they napped, in terms of the amount of hand washing that we were already doing. Um, 
So a lot of it was already happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think the big struggle is going to be if they have to be socially distanced, physically distanced, because right. you can't keep a four-year-old away from another four-year-old. And of course, we have infants, college, preschoolers, right. and whatnot. Yeah. One of yeah. the biggest issues being floated right now in childcare is that if your school district is two days a week, where do those kids go the other right. three days? Yeah. So there are a handful of childcare, primarily centers, because that's like that, that's who I've heard from because family jobs are structured differently, wherein they don't know if they're opening their own three-year-old program, four-year-old program because they can serve so many more school agers. So what does that look like? But their districts haven't told them what's happening mm -hmm. yet. So they're stuck in this limbo of do they support the 55 school age families or are they like, good luck, see you later, we're just going to work with the, the 15 so like those are things that are but then another thing to consider is those kids going to school two days a week yeah, then go to daycare for two days yeah. and bring all those terms back to school the <laughs> there's so much yes. it's a lot it is a lot and i think that there are districts who rolled out a plan and are regretting doing it early so if there are districts who are waiting i mean i think that's mm -hmm. smart and that's why they're waiting like let's roll out the plan when we really know and we don't have to backtrack and say i would encourage any administrators in the room to do maybe contact someone who does the before and after care program in your district and find out like if they're waiting on you and what sort of support you can offer them because like one of the districts I heard from they're one of like two before and after school programs in their entire town. Right. So if they're not in operation, they've lost a lot of spots in that yeah. town and they were like in this case the administration of that school department was very dismissive of their concerns. Mm -hmm. So that was very frustrating to hear that like we're doing But I would encourage administration to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You reach out. Or did, did they hear her okay? I was just wondering. Um, so what um, she said was administrators out there, if you know what the plan is at the school level, or you're thinking about what the plan is, and you have an idea to reach out to your local child care providers, who, you know, if you're doing a hybrid model, they're going to be there supporting your school age families. And um, thing I need for intro to centers so that when I get to school at 750, I'm not running around my classroom. Um, we do a lot of meeting times at that time. And I want everything ready so at 9.05 when I do intro to centers, it's all laid out on the shelf next to my chair. And then I usually just take it component by component through the day. How do you do it? I, so in this curriculum, you need to be prepared. So like Sarah, Melissa said, I can call you Sarah, I'm very sorry. It's <laughs> Get everything you need for the next day prepared the night before. I was lucky last year where um, I did my read aloud first thing, and then we had a short like 25 minute special where the kids were out of the room. So that, I took that full time to set up my centers. Um, your schedule is not always going to work that way, but if you can get some free time before centers, it will be very beneficial so that you can actually set up your classroom. Just be aware as early as you can, you know, if there's a certain material, you know, just know what you need, but then yeah. definitely um, using the day before, making sure you, you know, mm -hmm. things are yeah. Where, yeah, set up and ready Or maybe you have an ed tech in your classroom who can help during that time or help set up something, mm -hmm. get it ready for the day before. My ed tech is a goddess who walks on water, so I try to just not make her do anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, your ed tech is very important, or the other is in your classroom, is an integral part of this curriculum, and they're going there and working with the kids in the classroom just as much as the teacher. They really are. Yeah. Yeah. And coordinating that transition. Maybe if you have the students in the whole group, then they're putting things out on the tables for the next yeah. transition. Oh, yeah. they have Last last year was a group that loved read aloud, so I had that read aloud time in the morning. And my ed tech before I started my read aloud, I'd say, "Okay, this is what we're doing at easel today. I need this, this, this colored paint. This is what we're doing here. I need this, this, this colored paper at art center." And she'd be like, "All right." So I would start that read aloud, and she'd be like, you know, setting everything up and getting it all ready. So while also keeping an eye on the group and making sure she doesn't <laughs> need to come over and help support a child. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. I had a good group yeah. that was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My yeah. group was not the same as Sarah's, and my ex <laughs> was sitting with her, last with her hand on and a foot on the like this. Yeah, so true. It depends on your group. You have your schedule, your group, wherever yeah. you can fit it. My ex takes over.
over and like if I'm absent for a day, she does the next day's yes. curriculum. Um, that's a good point. If you are not there, your curriculum doesn't stop. Your ed tech knows, will know this curriculum inside and out just like you do, and so they will become the teacher the next day, and whatever stuff you get will be, well, yeah. they'll be the ed tech. That's how we run it. Yeah, that's how I run it. Um, but your, if you do day one and then you're out on day two, then your ed tech does day two. Um, I got two more. The first one is super quick. Office hours next weekend going forward with reopening. Are we recording those? Uh, I wasn't planning on it, but. I didn't hear the question. Oh. She's going to record the office hours for next week. transitioning back. And she's not planning on it, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I hadn't given it much thought. Um, I'm I my uh, I'm only hesitating because I I know the process of recording and then getting it posted and the time that that takes, so I'm just trying to run through my mind real quick if that'll be useful. Um, yeah, and so we're holding them three days. It might be more helpful to have somebody like take notes. Yeah. I, I don't have a final answer on that yet. I have to sleep on that. Well, my other hesitation too is when we've done open office hours in the past for other things, they're not necessarily always well attended or worth recording, to be perfectly honest. So I don't want you to think that it was recorded. Go look, you know, it's, that's where my head is just. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so at the moment, I'm still fearing on no, I, my plan is not to report that. Okay, and last question from the chat. My program runs three full days a week. Does this mean that unit one will take seven weeks to complete? Good question. So we get asked this a lot. Um, do you want me to restate it? So the question is around the program, the pre-K program operates only three days a week. So in essence they would do day one day two day three and then be done for that week and then the next week do day four day five day one like so that's the question do i do it that way or are there things that that i um, eliminate and in that scenario would the units take that much longer to complete um so i know it's so hard I'm on the edge of my seat waiting to see what you said that week five world so that you have the week five wiggle room. Um, you don't necessarily even have to do week five. Like you might just, sorry, I'm scrolling so fast. Hold on. Um, you might just have, let me pull up the schedule. Like this might be just for argument's sake, let's say it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So this might be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday. And then see on day five, um, intro to centers does introduce two new activities, but a lot of the other activities are continued. So I might just try and play with this week by week to see. You might make your own way. You're right. Yeah. Yes, right. like this might be revamped for you. Maybe um, you don't do printing with objects for three days, maybe you do it for two. Right, two yeah. So it's really gonna go unit by unit. There's not like a flat answer for that. Um, it's the same with a lot of our districts that operate two full day programs, like a, a Monday, Wednesday, and a Tuesday, Thursday group. Um, the, it's the same scenario. You sort of just need to play it out and really gauge your students' interest and engagement and activities. So just because this is what we say day three looks like, it might be more skewed for you. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not gonna be any easier, I guarantee that. Um, it's gonna be more work and planning, but once you've got a schedule that works, um, keep it. And yes, it, it could very well mean that unit one is no longer four weeks long. Now it's five or six weeks long. Um, that's a, that's a possibility. Can you just scroll down to small groups? You can just sort of see how that three day rotation looks. So here are your small groups. Um, group one is literacy, group two is a math, and group three is independent. And it takes out that first block of the first three days. Yeah. And then you can see that days four and five begin a new set. And sometimes there's two options, like group one literacy might be this activity and this activity, and you would very simply just choose the one that your children need or that you want to do. Um, or maybe use one as a small group and use one as a center. If you really want to do both activities. Yeah. 
and like we said, these are flexible. So um, maybe maybe later on down the road, unit two, book browsing comes up again as an independent activity, but you really want to do um, a fine motor activity or a sensory activity. You can just do it. Um, and then at the top, so uh, back here on the, these are all the uh, lesson plans and all of the components and all of the centers are listed down the left-hand side here, as I was saying before. There is the Swipple activities. Uh, yes, they're typically at the top. Um, so Swipple and Numbers, uh, they're additional resources. So the bingo game that they were talking about, resources for that are here. So if you wanted to just print your, um, print these letters and cut them, that resource is available. And then they, um, Morgan was showing the hand clapping. So that could be what you put on the back of the letter to show when they need to clap. So those resources are there. All of the poems that you need are here. You can print them out on eight by 10 and use that, or you could rewrite them um, onto easel paper or a whiteboard or something. Um, so that you don't need to purchase the big poems that, that they were showing us. Can be I love them though. So yeah. like, I have some extra money in my budget and I'm gonna take this and go print it at Staples or you have a poster printer in your district. I love my posters. Yeah. Okay. One font over another. Good question. Um, I don't know that the fonts, I, I okay. can't really speak to that personally. Um, I'm not sure if that was discussed when we were writing it. There are some, there is a letter matching activity where you, where you use various fonts so that it's you can actually see the that, that this A is still an A. Um, right. Right. But the children, I mean, they're being friends. That you can expose from, them. Right. Yeah. No, I, I totally oh, yeah. That's, why I'm that's a great question. Um, there's also the clue game, which is another big swipple activity that you'll see come up throughout the unit. So there's specific clues that you would give to the students when you're doing this game. Um, so for example, when you, the idea being that um, you're giving them clues to, of an, to identify an object and they're supposed to identify it. So the first clue you would give around the object being a harmonica is, I'm thinking of a word that's the, same, that's the name of a musical instrument. You hold the instrument in your mouth and blow into it. Okay, and so that, they've been introduced so to these are the are words. Already. And they all have picture cards to match. So we were just doing the harmonica. Did I not put them? Um, and so then if, if, as you go through the game and eventually when it is guessed or when it's not guessed and you're ready to expose it, this is the image that you would show. And this is a game I'll play when we're waiting. Like if I just need to fill some time, I will grab one of our read alouds that sit on my easel and look for the picture and say, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, the whole, oh, I was going to say, so those are all the resources for Swipple, but to find the actual schedule for yeah, Swipple down. is down more. And there it is. So if you print unit one and one, that's your whole week, all in one. Yeah, yeah the Swipple lesson plans are, are slightly different than the others. Right. You got all your materials listed for day, day one, one, and then the procedure for each of the songs. And that procedure will change. Like you might see five green and speckled frogs in week one, is going to look different in the spring. So don't just look and say, okay, five green and speckled frogs again. You really have to read through the procedure. I love it when, uh, you know, oh, today two of the frogs stay homesick. How many are coming? And they know it that three, and they're just shouting it out at you. Or, you know, two friends are joining the frog. Now there are seven. And, um, so it becomes different throughout the year. So as you scroll through this resource, that was day one, then you'll see day two come up. Because remember, some programs don't do Swipple every day, depending on their schedule. So I, I don't want to confuse you by saying yeah. that. But. I actually keep my Swipple like this in a separate binder. Yes. Yeah. So I'll print this every week, and then every.
every activity I get to, I check off because sometimes you run out of time, you didn't get to all the activities. So then I'll still have it for those in between times, those transition times, and be like, oh, look, I didn't get to do that circle today, so we're going to do that right now. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that way I know, got that done, got that done, got that done. Right. Circle is something you don't want to miss because it builds throughout the year. Right, and if you, build, you missed that activity last week and then it built on this week, there. Yeah, I would. Yeah, you definitely need to do it. Um, a lot of our half day programs might only do this like three days a week instead of five, and then you know either eliminate something or roll it over. It's they get really creative. With it. But it's hard because there is such a scope and sequence to all of the lessons that you don't want to just randomly eliminate activities. Right. You've really got to pick and choose. So yeah, these are right at the back. Uh, just go back to, so when I first clicked on unit one family on the image of the family, it brought me here. Um, so there's a unit one overview. This is really great um, for educators as well as administrators if they want to know what your um, focus is for this unit. Um, the and concepts. I would provide that to my administrator before I started every unit during a pilot year. So he would know what he was looking at when he walked into our class. Mm -hmm. And then the center language supports is its own link here. I keep mine on a clipboard. I have a clipboard in each center, and I just go to the next one that I need in that activity. I will point out that you can also do a grade on a subgroup. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anytime there's any sort of guest adults. Right. Or you're being observed, and yes. for the most part, you're great, but maybe you're having a moment where you just can't think of what to ask or what to say. Just take a peek at your um, a question to ask or vocabulary mm -hmm. to use. And it just kind of will get you going again. They're all deep thought provoking, like critical thinking questions. So your admin can be like, wow, that's a good question. <laughs> I do have a chat room question. Sure. Um, the question, the question is, is any recommendations on how to persuade my district to let me implement the curriculum fully? It's free. It's free. <laughs> Show them um, Boston Public School research. research. And that it's yes. world renowned and that we, you know, follow yeah. that format. I think with administrators, data speaks a lot, um, yes. and so that's what you need to get them. So Boston research and data, I haven't personally seen it, but I've heard about it, and it's um, out of the world. Um, and really, I think that's the approach I would take. Speak their language so that your kids can play. Right. You could start implementing these components on your own, and that when they see the numbers and the standards your children are meeting and say, How did you do this? you can say, I free sourced the curriculum off the main DOE website and implemented these components. Um, I think that's what one of our first grade teachers did, and now we are putting it in all first grade classrooms. So this is just quickly the Boston Pre-K site, or the Boston Public School site. Um, it's bpsearlylearning.org. They have some really fantastic videos um, on here as well. They show their pacing calendar. Oh, this is what uh, we were talking about, set up for success. That first, like, four to six weeks of school, um, some things, some resources there. They changed the, um, they did they change a little. They focused on K1, which was their pre-K, and focused on K2, which was their K, but it's been focused focus on pre-K. Mm -hmm. Maybe so many people are using it now. Yeah. So lots of great videos here that I would share with um, administrators as well. Um, there's some interviews with teachers, and some of these are my favorites. Here's the assessment tab, their book list. Which our book list is similar. Pretty similar. Different. Yeah, their vocabulary cards, the PD that they offer. Um, and then each unit, which is the same unit titles. Yeah. And then I just wanted to see, though, their research. Right here. So this is what you would share with um, an administrator, perhaps a parent or a family member that's questioning it. Um, our pre-K for me has not been directly researched in Maine. It is something that's on our list. Um, we just haven't had the funding to do it yet. We've reached out to some of our higher ed communities to see if any 
graduate students or anybody that's doing like a dissertation or something would be willing to do this as their project. Um, I do have to take my project on. Oh, that would be amazing, <laughs> Sasha. So, uh, so it's something that we are considering and trying to figure out our options for. Um, we would like to have it researched in Maine because we have made some tweaks and edits to it. Um, but this whole document, 36 pages, tells you or would tell an administrator uh, pretty much everything they will go and need to know, yeah. yeah. And we've seen, we've been to many conferences where um, Dr. Jason, Jason Sachs, which is, he's the uh, director there, has spoken to all of this and he does a really good job. But. One thing that is different about Boston Public Schools is in the main pre-K for me, is they have building blocks as their math. Yeah. And ours is already included. Mm -hmm. Ours is all one stop job. So yeah. that when you look at their research, that might look a little different. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. I just wanted to know if I'm looking at the Boston Public, they yeah. actually have like actual learning. Yep. Resources. Yep. So, Oh. And it's the same, like this is, I think this is not part of the day. And, right. and I think some of their teachers even got permission to record some of the books. So yeah. that's something you could share instead I mean, of you recording it possibly. Like, 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 send the link to the parents that they have all the sheets, they can cut out mm -hmm. the school there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. 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 She was saying um, that what's important to consider is continuity between all pre-K classrooms in your district or school. You know, sometimes she's experienced one classroom or a couple classrooms where those teachers have that curriculum down and they're implementing it really well, and then other classrooms where maybe they're not getting the same results or implementing that as well and just kind of combating that, I guess, or figuring out ways to support the teachers who need more support, or maybe why are they not doing it as well, and then getting to the root of giving them the support they need to implement that work. And then the support is built in, the language right. is built in, the support yeah. is built in. And so with this curriculum, a lot of that support is built into what you can find on the website. There are language guides they can use to help support, expand their children's learning. Um, I think it comes down to also training and coaching mm -hmm. um, over and over. I think it comes back to coaching and just, right? <laughs> so our pilot year, we had a coach from the DOE and we had coaches from the Boston Public School System and that's why we have such a handle on this is because they were constantly helping us with the components, helping us with room setup, helping us with our schedules. Um, and that can, you can kind of access that in a different way. I mean, we can't come visit your classroom because we have to be in our classroom. But if you're wondering, hey, how is this thinking and feedback doing? Am I doing it right? Do you offer any suggestions? You could videotape yourself and send it to us or we can watch it together with you on Zoom and give you feedback and coaching that you might need or, you know, is my classroom set up okay? Do you have any recommendations and being open to that? I think sometimes we might see discrepancies across classrooms because teachers have a hard time letting go of what they've been doing for so long. Mm -hmm. You just have to trust it. Mm -hmm. I promise. <laughs> that, that, that's a huge point. And like our coach, uh, I, <laughs> our coach um, that she was talking about, uh, you know, who point held our feet to the fire and said, you need to do this with fidelity if you're going to see results. And I am thankful for that. So. so yeah, there's a ton on that site. Too. Yeah, there is a lot. We also have sometimes if you go through their units, they'll have examples of the way that they did activities in Boston, and you might not want to do it exactly because you want to do things your way, but it'll give you some ideas to spark that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember in our pilot, we kept asking for ideas, and they didn't want to limit us, but then realized we needed some kind of jumping off point yeah, that's the website. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of 
math resources. Yeah. Um, there's observation tools you can use if you want to use that. Um, there's how to communicate with families about the math learning that you're doing. Um, and then there's the technology supplements and resources written by Donna Parr. So we're about six minutes short of lunch. Is there any questions or other thoughts you're having? So when we come back um, from lunch at one o'clock, Patty Bailey will be joining us. And so she's gonna talk to us about the outdoor learning component, which is in those week by week access. Um, and there's some nature extensions there too. But as you scroll down through these, you'll see the outdoor learning nature and extensions and then each week one activity that you could supplement into the curriculum. Um, again, if you're starting brand new and you're just not ready to do this yet, that's okay. But having Patty on today, walking us through this and then um, having a chance to ask her questions is gonna be huge. She's just a wealth of knowledge. She's so passionate about outdoor learning and nature extensions. Um, she's a fantastic resource to have. And one of the handouts um, that I gave to you through the email and that were available here is a position statement that she was part of. Um, so this can, if you haven't had a chance to read this yet, maybe during lunch you could just quickly skim it and um, you'll kind of have an idea of the things that we'll be talking about later on. And the outdoor component, like I think we've already said, but it's going to be so important this year. Yes. I know everybody is wondering how do we do the curriculum this year? And being outside and doing these outside activities is going to be a huge part of it. Yeah. First one is, um, oh, I may have three now. Uh, so there's a visual book list. Is there anything like a visual song list or like one place where all the songs are, all the song printouts are? Yeah, so the songs are all within the Swipple. I went past it. I'm sorry for my scrolling. Um, if you remember down on the left-hand column where there's Swiplin and you click in the unit one, week one, or wherever you're at. So there, I don't know that there's a separate list. There is a Boston website, so they might be like different. There were more pages there, but I know that when I was looking at it, I think you have a list of all the songs. Yeah. So typically September is our dream month of the DOE because it's quiet. Everybody's getting back to school. So I would love to say that that would be a great task for us to take on. So we'll see though how this. September goes. It may not be as quiet as past years. Okay, the next. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. That's, that's the goal. Um, the next question is: Is there a fidelity checklist that's currently being used? So I imagine that during the pilot there was one. Um, I it's not posted anywhere. I'll have to fish around for it. I know. Or I would gauge a guess that they, yeah, I would guess that they use the one from the owl that was developed. Um, I don't know that for a fact, though, that would take a little fishing on my part, which I'm happy to do because I know where to fish for it. Um, but I, I don't think you're still using it now. But that would be a good guess. Yes, yeah, that's what I would fish for. So that's another great September activity. <laughs> so a fidelity checklist is just something that um, a coach or administrator or a co-teacher would use when they're in the classroom observing um, a lesson. And you just sort of go through and make sure that the teacher that's guiding the lesson with the students is sort of hitting all of the key points. Um, and then it gives you a really clear view of what's lacking, or where you could maybe enhance the lesson, enhance an interaction, enhance the material, whatever the case may be. Um, and then there was a question about library and listening. Yep. Yes. I do have audiobooks in my library. Um, so you can either have it on iPad, and then some teachers who have the audio and you can have books, you can listen to books. Um, I have an actual CD player that they can put in the whole book. Yeah, I was wondering if technology ever called that out, but I'm not sure 
I do not have audiobooks in my library. We do get yeah. yeah. lots of books that we traded up to the end in the American I do because I always use my slacks and my phone to find audiobooks. audiobooks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I like personally love audiobooks, so I it, I think that, that would be something I would try and incorporate in my classroom. Um, but it's not necessarily a specific part of this program. It, it would be an add-on. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So I'm going to end the Zoom meeting so that I can download this morning's recording, um, and I'll have it open back up.